Welcome to Medscape. I'm your host, Dr. Andrew Wilner. Today, I'm interviewing Dr. Jason Aldred about his presentation at this year's American Academy of Neurology meeting. Dr. Aldred is a movement disorders specialist at Selkirk Neurology in Spokane, Washington, who has been searching for ways to improve treatment for Parkinson's disease and other movement disorders. Welcome, Dr. Aldred. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Dr. Aldred, we're recording this uh, kind of uh, just after the actual meeting, and I think sort of in the midst of the virtual meeting, and uh, you had a pretty interesting paper, so tell us about it. Yeah, this, this uh, uh, project that was accepted for presentation uh, at the recent uh, American Academy meeting uh, basically is a 52-week uh, phase three open label uh, single arm multi-center study. Uh, that, that I was fortunate to be involved with, with a group of fellow uh, collaborators and investigators from uh, uh, institutions around the, the uh, country. And uh, basically what this was, it was open label. So this is subcutaneous uh, infusion of FOS, carbidopa, FOS, levodopa, uh, which is a, 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 the preparation uh, for subcutaneous infusion ultimately of, of levodopa was delivered as, as a therapeutic drug. So um, with this, uh, you know, the whole idea here is, you know, we, we all know that patients with Parkinson's disease do well with levodopa and, um, you know, many for a long time, some for shorter periods of time, but uh, a real problem, of course, is the wearing off of medication. Uh, there's problems with gastric emptying of oral uh, levodopa, um, and there's definitely a significant need for more advanced therapies. Um, you know, we have advanced therapies right now, deep brain stimulation. We've, we've got, you know, newer, better oral medications than standard carbidopa, levodopa, and adjunctive medications, and uh, duopa, which is a uh, uh, intestinal infusion of carbidopa, uh, levodopa. So uh, the whole idea here is this uh, uh, treatment, ABBV951, uh, is a subcutaneous continuous infusion via a, a pump. So that's kind of the, the, the what we were dealing with here in the Hawaii. Um, the way that this uh, study was designed is, again, it was over 52 week period and there was an initial screening period of about uh, one month, about could be 10 to, to 40 days ish. And uh, during that period, there was a monitoring uh, days, a couple of days where they were monitored closely and then uh, converted over from uh, oral carbidopa, uh, levodopa, uh, plus the COMT inhibitor, if any of that was on board. Those are all uh, kind of calculated together to levodopa uh, equivalents. And uh, we converted uh, those subjects uh, to uh, the, the study drug this uh, FOS carbidopa, FOS levodopa. And then they were optimized for a period. The other drugs had to stay uh, level, but the, the infusion uh, uh, FOS carbidopa, FOS levodopa, uh, that was adjusted for a period of up to four weeks. And then uh, we just maintained them for 48 weeks. And the analysis of the information that I'm just gonna summarize briefly today is, is looking at the 26 week uh, mark. And so uh, basically, th this study was designed primarily for safety. That was our primary uh, endpoint. And uh, we found that uh, 223 patients ultimately were, were enrolled across about 56 sites. Um, there were a, a few discontinuations. About 39% had a premature discontinuation. Uh, but keep in mind that this is the first time uh, there's been a subcutaneous levodopa uh, infusion, uh, you know, experimental therapeutic like this, where we're trying to you know, deliver it in a very different way. So th there was a bit of a steep learning curve. And once uh, the patients, uh, uh, once we, they kind of got the hang of it, we, we saw uh, a lot uh, fewer discontinuations, you know, overall, as we got more experience and the, the patients got, the subjects got more experience. But, but basically, so the, these uh, were Parkinson's patients with disease duration, you know, of around, uh, 10 years roughly, uh, and uh, some were, were milder, some were more significant with their, their hone and yarn staging. So there, there, were, there was kind of a, a, a wider range. Uh, these were all non-demented patients and all of them had taken variety of Parkinson's medicines in the past, uh, you know, which you would expect if they've had Parkinson's for, for 10 years or so. And, um, you know, we, we again, looking here at, at, at the, the adverse effects and safety of this, well, um, Overall, uh, there were, you know, significant uh, findings with erythema, nodule, cellulitis, edema. Those were kind of our, our top of our list. And we weren't really surprised by that in the sense because this was a, 
subcutaneous uh, infusion uh, treatment. But, um, you know, when we went back and looked at uh, some of the literature as well for other uh, subcutaneous infusions, whether it's um, um, insulin or um, um, the subcutaneous uh, apomorphine, uh, you know, you, you see a lot of, of skin reactions, particularly when uh, people are starting out, it appears. So that was, it, it kind of fit more or less. You want things to make sense, I guess. And it sort of made sense that that's what we were seeing. Now, uh, just because the subjects had adverse effects in the skin didn't mean that they all, all discontinued. In fact, most of the patients uh, that, that had side effects actually ended up continuing in the study. But, but that's really what it was uh, focused on primarily. So that's sort of a, 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 a you know, specific uh, adverse effects as it's related to this method of treatment you know, because this is very much a learning process still. So what we found very interestingly, in terms of our, uh, some of our secondary outcome measures, we found that there is uh, initially a, a significant amount of people with uh, off time at baseline, about 36, 37% uh, of patients uh, had, uh, uh, or, 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 or sorry, about of all the patients, uh, about 36% of their day was spent in off time at baseline. And then when we did this analysis at week 26, we found that of all the, the patients that made it to week 26 at that time, there were about 100, uh, we found that uh, their off time uh, reduced from about 36% of the day to 17% of the day, which, you know, that, that makes sense with a, a type of levodopa therapy that has um, some potency. What was, what was very interesting though, is we found that uh, the on time uh, without dyskinesia initially started out to be about, 40%, but that actually increased uh, from 40 to 68, almost 69%. So this is an on-time on patient rating, so on-time without dyskinesia. And, and so there was really a, a significant increase in that, it, it looked like. Uh, and, and what was also kind of kind of interesting is they're, they're actually, their on-time with non-troublesome dyskinesia actually decreased uh, because there was such an increase in on-time without any, any dyskinesia. Uh, and, and a good chunk of these patients. So that was kind of an interesting uh, finding. And then one of the other findings we reported on um, at the meeting was that at the week 26 uh, mark for the patients that reached that point, um, uh, the first motor state upon awakening, which initially it was 77% of the patients, uh, or 77% of the time they had off time uh, on awakening. And then uh, in uh, the, the group at week 26, only 20% had on time, or sorry, had off time on awakening. So these were patients with subcutaneous infusion that went from initially waking up off to a, a larger, much larger portion waking up on, um, being on this 24-hour uh, subcutaneous infusion uh, treatment or experimental therapeutic. And, and so, you know, we just have ways of, of looking at other quality of, of life measures as well. Again, this is through the, 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 the halfway mark the subjects that reached that, we saw by week six, the PDQ39, Parkinson's sleep scale, MDSU, Peter S, our, our, our Parkinson's uh, uh, motor, uh, subjective motor section part two. Um, they, 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 the subjects all improved pretty quickly by, by week six and maintained that more or less all throughout uh, the week 26 uh, measurement. So, you know, it, it's, it's early. Definitely early uh, in terms of, uh, you know, reviewing this, this is just the halfway mark of a study that has a 52 week uh, total uh, uh, time duration, but we felt that it was, uh, you know, very encouraging that uh, these patients um, uh, really uh, had potentially a therapeutic alternative to, you know, other, other advanced therapies. In general, it was safe and well tolerated. Um, the skin adverse effects, which was, you know, that, that was what we expected. The, the main uh, difficulty to be in, those were consistent more or less with other subcutaneous therapies. Uh, of the discontinuations that occur, I would say that most of them occurred actually in the first 12 weeks of the study. So uh, again, the, the, the point here is we're still learning a lot about this. Um, we're learning along with, with some of the subjects involved here. And so um, once we kind of get over that initial hump uh, and hopefully uh, learn better how to, to counsel people and educate about this. Perhaps that would be a, you know, a something where we could see other improvements down the road, but it seems to be an, an efficacious 24 hour uh, treatment so far, uh, but you know, we still have a lot of, a lot more work to do.
Dr. Alder, thank you for that excellent summary. I just want to ask a few uh, tiny questions. Uh, I think one of the reasons the abstract caught my eye was this FOS levodopa. Now, I'm a, uh, an epileptologist, and I'm familiar with FOS phenytoin. So is it the same idea that it's less toxic to give, the, is it a pro drug of levodopa and it goes in without creating, you know, without irritation and then metabolize, what's going on there? Well, you know, uh, levodopa for all of its uh, miraculous, wonderful, you know, abilities uh, is, is a, I mean, it's a remarkably uh, simple chemical. It's a large neutral amino acid, uh, but the, the, the problem is solubility. Uh, it's always been the, the problem with levodopa uh, formulations. And so uh, the, the idea of getting it into uh, a soluble form uh, that can be concentrated enough to, to put it into a, you know, a, a pump type device that one could carry uh, with them, you know, wear on them in a convenient manner is really, I mean, it's a, a, a feat of, of chemistry, I, I think, to the designers of this. And so this FOS carbidopa, FOS levodopa, uh, pro drug is, I believe, the, the right term. What what happens is once this is infused into the skin, uh, it's converted by alkaline phosphatase to carbidopa, uh, levodopa. So that's that's uh, you know kind of and, and that that uh, enzyme is is ubiquitous you know throughout throughout the body. Uh, so uh, uh, allowing the uh, uh, metabolic profile to you know, be fairly even based on what we infuse, how we start it and infuse it and continuously deliver it over a course of, you know, for some patients, it's a couple of days at a, a single site. Um, it, it, it so far has looked uh, very promising. Now, from a practical point of view, is this, uh, you mentioned size, is this kind of like an insulin pump? I mean, how big is this thing that the patients- Yeah, uh, it's, I would say it's, uh, well, the, if, if, if anyone out there has seen the Duopa pump, uh, it's certainly uh, much smaller than the Duopa pump visually. Uh, it's, I, I think, um, a, little, a little larger than an insulin pump, but not, not a lot. Uh, it's fairly, fairly small and convenient and, and user-friendly with respect to how it's positioned on the body. Um, and um, how people are able to wear it throughout the day and, and also sleep with it. And this is, again, we had, we had quite a few subjects at our site in this uh, study. And, and, you know, obviously that was one of the, the key things we were always asking them was like, well, what do you like it? You know, I mean, is it something that, you know, are you satisfied uh, uh, so far? And does it, you know, uh, you know, tell us what we need to know, what we need to learn about this. And uh, it, it was uh, pretty, pretty, um, uh, encouraging, I guess I would say, to have uh, uh, the majority of the subjects were, were pretty positive about the actual device itself. You know, of course, the skin uh, reactions, those are the things we're struggling with, but it was didn't seem to be the, the, the device itself was particularly problematic in the people that I encountered. Now, I know this is an initial kind of exploration of the efficacy of, of this approach, but in your experience as a movement disorder specialist, you follow, you've been following these patients for a year now, and I guess we'll hear about the 52-week result uh, at some point. Yeah, we're, we're working on, on looking at that data right now. But the, uh, in your experience, how do you think these results compare to a more invasive uh, treatment, say like deep brain stimulation? In other words, if I was a patient and I was having trouble and I said, gee, I really want DBS, would you say, well, let's try this first, do you, do you think, or is, you know what I mean? Yeah, I, I, I do. And uh, it's, a, uh, you know, f it's a good problem, I think, for, for us neurologists and for uh, uh, potentially for patients, if this ultimately, uh, you know, is shown to be uh, useful and, and approved. Um, uh, you know, I think we're, we, we're entering a situation uh, with advanced therapies for Parkinson's where, you know, it used to be we didn't have any options, uh, just use your medicines better. Then we had deep brain stimulation. Um, you know, then we've had uh, uh, Duopa. Uh, and and, um, and uh, now uh, we're looking at potentially a subcutaneous infusion. So I, I think that it, it absolutely throws more options uh, out there. You know, it's not just one or two, it's three. And so not only uh, three options, but, you know, how do we potentially use one with respect to, to the other? Because ultimately we're just trying to do the best thing for our patients, get the best benefits with the, the fewest side effects and, and most practical so they can go back and, 
and live the life that they that they want to. Uh, so I, I think that there's just a lot to think about. Uh, and, and fortunately, I think that's a good problem we'll be busy with for a while. Um, you know, I could see uh, patients uh, uh, choosing this uh, before a deep brain stimulation. I could see people that were very uh, 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 impressed with how deep brain stimulation uh, fit for them, and they might choose that first. And then, you know, rather than struggling with oral meds, if we were still doing that later on, they, they might choose this for perhaps. Um, and, and also, I don't think that we should um, write off the, the role that Duopa itself uh, still plays for advanced Parkinson's disease. It's been FDA approved for for advanced PD. And um, I think there are some people that may not uh, uh, be able to do or have the care support, let's say, to do uh, uh, skin administrations and to you know, reapply the, the site every few days. And, and for those patients, a semi-permanent uh, PEG-J tube, you know, actually might be a, a really good option. So, so I think that it definitely muddies the waters, but uh, we, we, we need a little, a little, uh, more option and in advanced PD and and uh, I hope that that this is something that will will really you know get us there if we can can follow up on on the, the work and see see what this uh, what the long term further long term safety and efficacy data shows. Uh, one last uh, question. So, in the best of all possible worlds, when can I prescribe this? What's our timeline? Yeah, uh, well, you know, uh, the the uh, group uh, is is working on, you know, first of all the, the the data review and making sure that we interpret that well, and then uh, there is an and uh, now uh, uh, ongoing uh, uh, placebo controlled trial uh, as well. So I, I think we'll have to wait uh, for the results of that and uh, um, see, you know, what what the the evidence shows uh, in terms of the effect and, and further uh, information about safety. And, and hopefully, you know, we'll see uh, in that uh, uh, randomized placebo controlled trial uh, uh, the, uh, uh, that we've learned stuff about the, how to administer this even better and, you know, better safety outcomes as well. So I think just stay tuned and hopefully in the next uh, a year or two, maybe uh, uh, it will be ready, but we wanna make sure we understand it well first. Well, that's pretty exciting. Dr. Aldrin, anything else you'd like to add? Uh, no, just uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to kind of having to navigate a lot of options in the future for these patients. Well, that's terrific. I want to thank you and your uh, colleagues for all your hard work. And uh, thanks very much for uh, joining us on Medscape. I'm Dr. Andrew Wilner reporting for Medscape.